Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and I'm absolutely delighted to have a colleague with me today, Dr. Amy Baker. Uh, Amy, you and I go back a bunch of years, um, and I met you at a cult conference, I believe, giving a presentation on parental alienation. And of course, you know, my background helping people get out of authoritarian cults, this is something that is pretty policy oriented with a lot of the major cults that if uh, if parents are in a cult and they have kids and one raises questions and exits, often the parent that's still in the cult with the kids wants to keep the kids in, wants to keep the that parent in. And so the group exerts a lot of undue influence to alienate them from the ex-member and yeah. to shut down communication. But when we met and I learned from you, I took your workshop, read your books, uh, you opened my eyes to a much bigger phenomenon. And I have done some blogs previously with a retired psychiatrist, Nick Child. I interviewed a woman who had been alienated from her mother by her father at age four, who's now writing a book about it. But you are a de developmental psychologist, and I wanted to get you to be able to sit with me and explain to my audience uh, what is parental alienation? I would like you to sculpt it out so that the average person can can get wrap their head around this complex phenomenon. Well, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, you know, one of the issues in the field is that we have adopted certain terms to have very specific meanings, like alienation, estrangement, etc. Those are words that people use in the common parlance, but for us, they have very specific meanings. And so the way to think about it is. Um, there are many family scenarios where a child might be aligned with one parent more than with the other. And sometimes kids just have a preference for one parent. And they have a good relationship with both, but they really are more strongly leaning towards one. You could have a scenario where a child is aligned with one parent and rejecting the other. In that situation, you want to try to figure out why. Why is this child you know, resisting, refusing, hostily rejecting this other parent. And there's really two main reasons why. We reserve the term estrangement for the scenario where a child's rejecting a parent for a legitimate reason, abuse, neglect, you know, substantially deficient parenting. Even though as an aside, we do know that most kids who have been abused, abandoned, neglected, molested, et cetera, do actually want a relationship with the abusive parent. They don't really reject them. But if they did, we would call that estrangement. Mm -hmm. We reserve the term alienation for the situation where a child is aligned with one parent, rejecting the other parent because the favored parent has manipulated the child intentionally or otherwise. You can't always know why people do what they do, but they've exhibited or engaged in certain alienation behaviors that foster in the child an unjustified rejection of the other parent. So if the rejection is justified based on the bad behavior of the rejected parent, it's estrangement. If the rejection is unjustified and engineered by the favored parent, we call that alienation. Great. Yeah. And, and uh, this is a worldwide problem. It involves millions and millions of people. And a lot of young people are now reaching adulthood, realizing that the story that their custodial parent was telling them about the other parent was wrong. Like it yeah. was a story. And not only were they cut off from that mother or father, but from that entire side of the family. So they missed out on aunts, uncles, grandparents, and all kinds of really rich uh, cultural and, 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 and uh, social uh, relationships. Um, so walk us through first, like what's a healthy parenting development? Like my understanding, I'm a parent of an 18 year old, he just went off to college. But from the very beginning, my understanding as a parent was my job was to steward my child to adulthood to help him be his best self, 
but not to make him dependent on me, <laughs> not to assume all of my beliefs ideologically or else I would hit him with corporal punishment or something, right? So healthy de you know, development, in my understanding, please add in, but it's developmentally appropriate encouraging kids to problem solve, to develop self-esteem by working hard to, to, to figure things out and isn't just very black and white, all or nothing, good versus evil, memorize this or else kind of thing. I agree and endorse everything you're saying. Um, and I think that where it gets hard for parents in a divorce is there's really a loss of control over what the other parent is doing and saying to your child, you know, you could be a vegan and they could be a carnivore and you can't control it if that other parent serves up a meatloaf for your kid. And, and when you're married, hopefully, more often than not, you find a way to compromise with your partner because you're invested in the marriage. So you make sacrifices and compromises so that the kids, you know, aren't torn apart. Um, but once there's a divorce, there's really no investment in trying to, or for many people, there isn't an investment in compromising and working things out. And so the differences become magnified. And so um, I think it's very, very hard for people to lose control over their kids. And it's very hard when the other parent is engaging in behaviors that are objectionable, offensive, or just um, not your values. You know, the vaccination is something that comes up a lot in, you know, in divorce cases where the two parents aren't agreeing and it's very high stakes for people, you know, some, um, so I think that for many people, there is a inclination to want to have the child all to themselves so that they don't have to deal with the you know, the, the sense of loss over not having as much influence over your child. I mean, parents want to have the pleasure of influencing their child. Um, and you lose some of that when you're in a divorce. Yeah. And, so. Yeah. And I was going to say that, I don't know, but my, my uh, education um, uh, says put the child's best interests first and rely on experts who have really invested the time and the energy to do real follow-up studies with real life situations to give guidance and because many times you know we get locked in our own feelings and our own beliefs and we're not looking at the big picture so for example my wife and i have been using a parent coach with our son who's very uh, uh, consequence oriented. Like he's not for punishment, but he's for like stating, here's the scoop. If you do this, this will be the consequence because you need to learn that in the real world, <laughs> you have actions have consequences, good ones and bad ones. And aiming at uh, allowing natural consequences to happen and not rescue my son when he, you know, spends all the money that he earns and then wants to buy something that isn't a, a, a need, it's a want. Right. But the like, problem is what do you do when the two parents don't get along? Because then it's sort of a race to the bottom because the parent is willing to rescue the child or lavish the child or or you know, not hold the child accountable. Sadly, kids sometimes can be wooed into spending more time with that parent. And you know, part of the, and there's so many aspects to this, but one thing that's a problem is that people conflate alienation, we're trying to manipulate the child to unjustifiably reject the other parent with bad mouthing. And so a parent might say, well, I don't talk trash about the other parent, so I'm not doing anything. But the truth is the science shows that there's 17 primary parental alienation strategies that a parent can engage in to unjustifiably reject the other parent. And a lot of times, you know, I have, I, I do parent coaching and a lot of times people come to me and they're like, oh, I didn't realize that when my ex did this and this and this and this, that it was all part of a pattern of eroding my child's sense of 
that I'm, you know, safe, loving and available. And a lot of times the courts even will say, well, there's no evidence that Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so bad mouthed, therefore it can't be alienation. And there's many ways to manipulate a child to unjustifiably reject the other parent. And to bring it back to cults, when I first started studying those 17 behaviors, it was pretty clear that to a great extent, there's overlap between the strategies that cult leaders use to manipulate somebody to you know, become loyal to them above all else and give up all their friends and family and money and freedom to go live on a cult, a lot of those strategies are the same. It's yeah, and of course, they... my model is uh, looks at behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions yep. along an influence continuum of healthy to unhealthy. And the more any relationship or group is doing those unhealthy behaviors, the more authoritarian it is. Can you give our listeners a few examples of some of the most common of the 17? Um, well, obviously there is bad mouthing. And to be clear, the purpose of the bad mouthing is to induce the child to believe that the other parent is unloving, unsafe, and unavailable. So as an attachment theorist, that's what I did my dissertation on, that's my developmental orientation, the essence of the secure attachment between a parent and a child is one in which the child experiences the parent as safe, loving, and available. And so the, uh, the, that first parental alienation strategy erodes the child's experience of the other parent as safe, loving, and available. So there's no one thing that a parent would say. It might be rolling their eyes. It might be uh, again, your father's five minutes late. You know, it doesn't have to be that parent wants to hurt you. That parent doesn't love you. It's it can be more uh, covert than that. Um, referring to the other parent by his or her first name. Uh, in fact, Steve, I remember giving a talk and you were in the audience, right? And I think I called on you and I said, what's one of the things that a cult leader does when a new member joins? And it's coming up with a new name for the person because it's creating a new identity. You know, you're not John Smith, the husband of so-and-so. You are now, you know, right. whatever some cockamamie, you know, cult name is. And so alienating parents do it by coming up with new nicknames for the kids, or um, it's sort of easier for moms to do it because they can use their last name instead of the dad's last name. And, you know, naming is power, it's authority, it's connection, and um, it is kind of creating a, we have a new reality. This is now who you are, and it opens the door to the child sort of thinking, oh, I'm a new person. I used to like this, or I used to do that, or I used to value this, but now I'm this new person. Another strategy is uh, referring to the targeted parent by his or her first name. And, um, you know, I have this theory that I have not really uh, scientifically studied, but I'm under the impression that in every culture, human culture, children have a name for their parents that parents introduce to them. And it usually starts with the syllables M and D because those are the first syllables that infants spontaneously babble and then the parents shape it. So the kid says, mama, 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 and it's like, yes, I'm your mommy. And we want in general for kids to have a special name for their parents because it connotes, um, uh, again, authority, privilege, special relationship, and when a child calls a parent by his or her first name, unless it's invited by the parents. So when I grew up, my parents wanted me to call them by their first name. So that wouldn't count. But if the targeted parents always been called mom, and then one day the child shows up and says, hi, Sally, you know, I don't want, I don't want to see you anymore, whatever. It really, for the parent, it feels like a punch in the stomach. It's yeah. so powerful. Yep. Because the child is saying, you're not special to me anymore. You're no more important to me than anybody else I would call by my first, by his or her first name. Yep. So it's just three right off the Yeah, top. that's really helpful. And I, I guess I want to also just, you know, highlight that um, I've encountered some really egregious cases where 
the custodial parent actually made up stories of being abused or sexually assaulted by the the uh, spouse, male or female, and there was no evidence that this actually happened, but it was portrayed to the child as if it was a fact. And there was no external forensic evaluation whether there was anything done wrong. And even to the point where kids would have be given like false memories of abuse where they were almost given suggestions of, don't you remember when you know, mommy touched you in the wrong place. You don't? Well, I was there. I saw it, blah, 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 blah and just kind of coaching yep. the child. And we know the brain can't distinguish between remembering something and remembering thinking about something. So if you think about it enough, then it, it almost becomes real. There's no real differentiation in the brain. The one thing I'll add to what you said is it's not just custodial parents who do this. Right. Um, I definitely know cases where, you know, the alienator was the every other weekend, you know, parent. Uh -huh. And it's really, you know, just like not everybody can be a cult leader, like you need charisma and you need, you know, sort of um, persuasion techniques. I've even looked at like a relationship between like marketing strategies and alienation strategies. And again, there's a lot of overlap. So there's certain skills and qualities you need to be an alienator or to be a cult leader. But um, it definitely is something that the non-custodial parent can engage in. Yeah, thank you for that, for sure. And uh, I really would like to mention that you created a very innovative booklet and maybe there's a training that goes with it for uh, guidance counselors that if they become aware that uh, like a middle schooler's parents are divorcing that a guidance counselor can come in and create a educational relationship with the child and 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 basically let them know it's not okay you know to be forced into a loyalty choice or something. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the book is actually called um, Getting Through My Parents' Divorce. So it's spoken from the kids, the titles from the kids' point of view. It's for children, yeah, roughly middle school, nine to 14. Um, and it's not just for guidance counselors, although I would love for every guidance counselor to have it. Um, sometimes parents give it to their kids. Um, you know, they have, I, work with them on how do you do that and you know what do you say when you're doing that and you can't look at it etc cetera, etc cetera. it's also therapists have used it with kids so the purpose is we take i think it's six skills that we teach kids one of which is critical thinking skills how do you know something's true what would happen if you changed your mind what's the evidence that you know that that belief is um, a true belief um having courage doing something even though it's hard, positive self-talk, getting help from other people, de-stressing. And we take those six skills that we teach them and then we apply it to the 17 primary parental alienation strategies. So it's like, what would you do if a parent said, um, you know, I, let's call mom Sally from now on. You know, what would you do if, you know, so we're teaching the kids, they have more choices and options than they might think. And actually one of the six skills is called considering your options because we don't want kids under any circumstance, whether it's peer pressure or whatever, to feel compelled to do something without thinking it through, whether it's ditching a parent or doing drugs or cheating on a test. And so uh, I think one of the reasons it's, it's um, I really like this book is because it's not just for alienation situations, these skills, considering your options, knowing your own truth, you know, um, thinking things through, et cetera. Those are good skills for kids that schools really aren't teaching anymore. Yeah, and I can't help but think my, my population of people who are exiting authoritarian cults, particularly if they were born or raised in them, and their parents are still in them, teaching them these kinds of skills of thinking, like what are my options? <laughs> and, and, and for me, teaching people who are raised in that environment, what's normal, like what's healthy, like how should it be? 
versus not. And for many of the people that I work with, they were corporally punished with paddles or belts as, as a child. Could you comment on corporal punishment as a developmental yeah. psychologist? So I'm actually involved in something called the National Initiative to End Corporal Punishment. And we now have a website and I'm not a leader. I'm sort of a peripheral person in this initiative, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, but it's a wonderful initiative of most of the leaders in the field, the people who have been doing research, George Holden, Eliz Gershoff, et cetera, um, people who have really been laying the foundation for what do we need to do to end corporal punishment. So it's a great repository of some of the facts about corporal punishment. And I think that, um, what do I, I mean, obviously I'm not in favor of corporal punishment. I'm just pausing for a moment to think about what else I want to say about it. I think that there are a lot of myths out there about it, like, well, it happened to me and I turned out okay, or it's the only thing that works, or my, my church says I should do it. And one of the nice things about this website is we have a place where we sort of address each of those. Good. Because people can sort of know that maybe it's not good, but they still have these reasons why they're going to do it, such as it's the only thing that works with my kid. And so we can show um, the sort of, we can debunk some of those myths to yeah. really, and, and there are so many alternatives at this point. Um, you know, one of the sort of saddest, most frustrating things for me as a developmental psychologist is why kids aren't taught parenting in, in high school. Yep. You know, it's just- And why their people aren't made to take a course before they get married to get a marriage license, like people take a driving test. Yeah, right. You if you adopt a child, you, you they get to come in and look at every can of soup you have in your cupboard, right? But if you if you know if if things biologically work out and you have a kid, you know, um, it would be really nice. I'm not so much sure that I think that there should be monitoring, but there should be support and more top notch parent education information out there. Yeah, totally. I did a blog or two with the retired social worker, uh, child protection advocate, David Cooperson, who wrote a little book called The Holocaust Lessons. And he's been trying to make it illegal for corporal punishment in the US. So I'm, I'm sure he's aware. tell him about this initiative because yes. um, there's, a, yeah, I mean, there's, there's many states where it's still legal in schools. Yeah, and we should say that most civilized countries have abolished corporal punishment. Yeah. Right, there's only two. I think it's the United States and Rwanda, and I could be wrong. Some, okay, so I don't know. I think it's an African country. I don't know which one. Everybody else, every other country has, has been a signatory to the UN Convention, right, supporting the abolition of corporal punishment. Yeah, and Har uh, Harvard uh, psychiatrist uh, Martin Teicher, who's been researching child trauma for decades, uh, said the science is overwhelming how bad it is for development and yeah. such. And so, it's ineffective. And it's ineffective. It's harmful and ineffective, right? right? It doesn't, it actually reinforces aggression. It's bad for the relationship. It's associated with all sorts of bad outcomes. It doesn't even teach what it's supposed to be teaching. How could you, if you hit a child for hitting their brother, how is the child going to learn that hitting's wrong? I mean, it's so patently illogical. Yeah, um, definitely. So I want to circle around back to attachment theory. I, I was not aware that you did your doctoral dissertation on attachment work. And for me, that's been such a dominant theme in my therapy work to help people with attachment uh, issues, whether it's insecure attachment or disorganized attachment, because they never felt that safety and that bonding early on. Can you share a little bit more about what you well, know about attachment? From an alienation point of view, I see alienation as the disruption of an attachment. In other words, if there was never an attachment, a secure attachment between a parent and child, then you can't claim alienation because right. the premise of alienation is you were a good and loving parent. You were good enough. Nobody's perfect, but you didn't abuse or neglect your kids. You had a good relationship. Then the other parent starts introducing these 17 behaviors and lo and behold, your child now, you know, is rejecting you. Um, it's so important 
for me to think about it as an attachment issue from a parent coaching perspective. And so part of what happens in alienation is the kids get wound up. They spend time with the alienator. They come back to the targeted parent and they're, you know, rude, entitled, angry, arrogant, hostily rejecting, et cetera, et cetera. And then the targeted parent either gets depressed and demoralized and gives up or they become reactive and angry. And so they end up reinforcing the message that they're unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. And so my parent coaching is really about how can you, in every interaction with your child, even if your child is spitting at you or saying, you beat me when I was a baby, when it's not true, how can you not reinforce the negative message? And it doesn't mean you say, oh, spit on me. Well, if you think I beat you, fine. Targeted parents really don't understand that you there's a way to respond that doesn't involve debasing yourself and groveling to your child or apologizing for things you didn't do, but also doesn't actively contradict the child and argue with them about, no, no, I didn't steal your college money. It's like very hard for them to see that there's this other way. And so that's really a lot of my coaching. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about how you speak to your child matters. And the example that I give is, you know, if your two-year-old says, I want ice cream for breakfast, you could say, that's ridiculous. Who eats ice cream for breakfast? Did your father put you up to that? Is he trying to stir trouble between us? But if you do that, you're reinforcing the idea that you're unkind. Because if you say to a child, that's not true, you're saying you're a liar. If you say to your child, that's ridiculous, you're saying to your child, you're a fool. It doesn't feel good. And then your kid doesn't want to be with you because you you're making them feel badly about themselves. Right. But the alternative isn't to get out the ice cream and scoop and give your kid Rocky Road for breakfast. The alternative is to say, oh, don't you wish ice cream were a healthy breakfast? That would be so fun. You can have ice cream after dinner. Now you can have pancakes or waffles for breakfast. You can join the child in the wish and create a feeling of closeness, even if you're not gratifying their wish. I know that's a very simple example, but it's a lot of what I do. Is it was excellent. It. And it's, it parallels the kinds of thinking that I, I have in my coaching with families. I, I, I pretty much always focus on rapport and trust building. And if you're going to make a communication, do a sandwich of warmth <laughs> before and after. You know I'm your mom and I love you forever, no matter what. And, you know, I hear your your request. Tell me more how you got that idea. Uh -huh. You know, and fish for more information. That might be one one thing and then I love what you do with the reframe you know wouldn't that be great and in general I always want to encourage my clients in the cult you know world if they're talking with a cult member is support them where you can so support them in their idealism support them in their dedication you don't agree with what the group they're dedicated to but that they have this higher standard to want to make the world a better place or to improve themselves and such. So I think that's huge. Now I want to uh, push you a little, if I may, Amy. And so if, if there's a 24 year old listening to this and hasn't talked to their mother since they were four, because dad, you know, said what a horrible, parent your mom was what words do you want to say to this person i guess be open to the idea that there might be another perspective and to ask yourself what would it mean to to know that maybe mom wasn't as bad as you've been told how would that feel for you what would it mean would it feel like a betrayal of your dad would it make you feel hopeful that maybe you can have a mom in your life. You know, I, 
you know, and if, and if people want to get educated about alienation, you can always learn about the 17 primary parental alienation strategies and ask yourself, gee, did either of my parents do this? Do I, what, you know, what do I really know is true for myself? Yeah, that's a great idea. We're going to put in the blog links to all of your books. You've written so many, you know, for parents, for, for kids, etc. cetera. Um, I, I guess I just want to share the woman that I interviewed, um, what she later found out she was in her 20s with her sister. They agreed to seek out mom. Where is she and, and the family? And uh, they were t petrified to do that because they didn't want dad to find out because apparently dad had a big temper and, uh, you know, they were afraid of his anger and such. But the story emerged when she tracked down her mom that her mom had felt abused by the dad, didn't know how to get out of the marriage, had an affair with another man. Dad found out and was so angry, took mom's belongings, threw it out on the front, you know, a lawn and ordered the two little girls never to talk with her. She's dead to them. Like that was... All they heard was mom's gone forever. She's a bad person, but never heard the story. Until you know, now. I think that sometimes these adult kids don't need to know the story, you know, and then, and this is true for the hypothetical 24 year old I'm talking to and to this person, sometimes they just want to start from now and that's okay. You know, they don't have to figure out, did dad lie to me or is mom bad? What is it? They can just say, I'm a 24 year old or whatever. I'm interested in seeing who my mom is now. And I want to see if we can have a relationship. It's hard for the targeted parent to tolerate sometimes the kid coming back and the parent not having the opportunity to tell their side of the story. And I encourage my parents to let go of that. You may never have a shared reality of what happened, but it's better to have a current relationship than not. And so not everybody has to figure out who's the bad guy. It's, it's sometimes it's complicated and you know, sometimes it's, oh, mom had an affair, but she had an affair because he was doing that, but he was doing that because she was doing this. You don't have to sort it all out. You can just say, I'm, I'm who I am now. Let's see if I can have this relationship make sense. Yeah, I love that you said that. And it's, again, another point where we are agreeing in terms of our pr uh, professional approaches, because I, I do tell all my clients, the now is the only time we have the past is a memory the future we can imagine a future but it's not here yet so like think about being present in your body what's within your control to do anything about and i i really i really like your advice about you know what you don't need to know unless you need to know in which case you take the steps but it's enough to think, you know what? I want to know more. And I want to know, know if... who you are today, yes. right? And um, it's very hard for targeted parents who sit in a place of being so misunderstood. Everybody is, you know, oh, you must have done something if your kid's rejecting you or the, you know, your lawyer doesn't care and your the judge is making bad decisions and the custody evaluator is misunderstanding and you show up at the school and all the other parents sort of sneer at you because they think you're some terrible person. And I mean, you live in such a place of shame and feeling maligned. And then if you're lucky enough to get your kid back, there is a hunger to have that like come to Jesus moment where, you know, where you're like, oh my God, now, oh, and that's what happened. And oh, so when you did this and I meant that and you thought this, but I, you know, I did a, an extensive set of interviews with adults who did reconnect with the formerly rejected parent. And at first I assumed everybody had the conversation and uh, there were plenty 
among the 40 that I would say, so what happened when you reconnected with your dad or mom, whatever it was? You know, did you have the conversation? And some of them said like, yeah, no, we just, we just moved forward. That was a real eye opener for me. Yep. There is a way to do it. And that the targeted parent has to um, accept that term and not strive to be totally understood by your child. There are other people, your coach, your spouse, your friends who can understand what you went through. Your kid, they may not. Yeah, I think that's so wise. So say a little bit more about the current state of the legal system and the disparities between people who have a lot of money who can, you know, uh, I think Alex Jones went through 14 expert witnesses in his uh, divorce and custody fight with his ex-wife. And uh, yeah, just talk about the hurdles that the current system faces and any ideas you may have for solutions. So when a parent, when a child's aligned with one parent against the other, usually it's the rejected parent who files a motion because the parent who has the kid, they don't need to file a motion. They have what they want, right? right. Possession is nine tenths of the law. So that parent files a motion, you know, either contempt or order to show cause like, hey, judge, I'm supposed to have this parenting time. I'm not getting it. So when they go to court, the rejected parent has a narrative. I was a good and loving parent. I didn't abuse or neglect my kids. The other parents unduly influencing. And now my kids got all the markers of an alienated kid. The other parent has a different narrative. It's either I don't want the kids to have a relationship with that parent. They're abusive. I need to protect my kids. Or I want them to have a relationship, but I shouldn't have to force them. It's his fault that the kids don't like him. It's not my problem. I want them to, I'll encourage them, but I can't make them and I shouldn't have to. That's the universe of options. Uh -huh. So judges, in my opinion, are in general, lazy cowards. I have said this when I've trained judges. <laughs> I look out, I go, you guys are lazy cowards. And they're not offended. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's true. They, they live in fear of forcing a child to visit a parent and then that child hurting themselves. That's what they're afraid of, that a kid will kill themselves on their watch. And there's research that shows that people have more discomfort over a bad outcome for an act of choice rather than leaving things alone, mm -hmm. right? So, so if the kid stays with that parent and gets hurt, that's not as scary or horrible for the judge for whatever reason and making the kid go and then the kid getting hurt. So the courts are biased strongly towards leaving kids where they are. And so the way that I think about the legal situation is that there's four points the targeted parent has to make to the judge in order to get what they want. And at any point, they're going to lose. Hmm. And they can't make those points. They need an expert. And so that's really where the money comes in. But the four points are alienation is real. So the other side can say it's junk science, blah, blah, blah. If the judge doesn't believe that alienation is real, you've lost. Alienation, number two, alienation is happening in this case. So a judge could say, yes, alienation is real, but I don't think it's happening here. You've lost. Point three, the court should intervene. So the court could say, yes, alienation is real. Yes, it's happening, but, and here the judge can say two things, either, but the kids aren't doing well, we can't rock the boat, or, but the kids are doing well, why rock the boat? And if the kid says either of those, you've lost. And the final hurdle is that the judge would order the proper treatment because the treatment the judge wants to order is outpatient reunification therapy, which generally doesn't work. So I think of this as a baseball game. You wanna get your kids home. And those are the four bases. And at any point, if you can't convince the judge, you've lost. And that's where experts come in and that's where it starts getting expensive. Mm -hmm. And I deal with parents every day who are making these, you know, heartbreaking decisions about should I file, should I continue? And, you know, I generally recommend that people make a very thought, thorough, exhaustive pros and cons. 
because sometimes people make the decision very um, just on an emotion basis. Like, oh, if I file another motion, my ex is going to come after me and I don't want to poke a, you know, the sleeping tiger. Well, that's one reason not to do it. There are other reasons. It's expensive, it's stressful, it's time consuming, et cetera. But there are also reasons to do it. And so I really encourage people to make a very careful, um, almost like a Bayesian analysis of like, what's the likelihood that this judge is going to get around, you know, mentally get through those hurdles, um, prior case law in this state, you know, or is there already case law that the judge has found alienation and referred to the proper treatment? How old is your kid? How much money do you have? What's the likelihood of success? And then you make your decision. Mm -hmm. And too often people just do it sort of like on sort of a reactive basis. Like, oh, this is really hard or I'm going to win because I'm right, you know, and you really it's it is a tough road to go down. Yeah. So so I hear you with judges are often cowards and uh, they're afraid of making a decision. They may have a bad result that then they'll feel like it's their fault. But if you had a wish, like what how would the system be different that would serve children better? I mean, we've talked about preventive education, potentially, you know, cultural education about undue influence and how to protect yourself. What, what are your thoughts? More training for judges. I mean, that seems like a doable thing. Um, I'm not a pie in the sky. I don't, I don't have the big answer to family court problems and how inconsistent. I've testified in two courtrooms that shared a wall, same, same, same state, same county, same building. And one, the judge, the judge was like, oh, alienation's junk science. I don't want to hear about it. The other's hanging on every word saying, of course, this is alienation. Let's fix this. So they have so much judicial discretion. Yeah. And, you know, that is a problem if they're untrained. Yeah. So what is the state of the science of parental alienation? I listened to a workshop Bill Burnett, um, a psychiatrist at Vanderbilt, gave on misinformation about parental alienation that's been repeated in academic journals, just like wrong. Just yep. But I also heard him uh, present at the American uh, Association for Psychiatry and the Law with um, a, a preference survey. It must have been yours that a child could fill out, you know, things that are positive about mom and, and negative about mom, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Forgive me. What's the, what's the state of the science? Well, yes, thank you. Um, I, I guess I would say, sadly, it depends on who you ask, because I've been in court with experts who in one courtroom will say, oh, alienation is junk science. And in another courtroom will say, of course, alienation is real. So um, the same it's just, person. Yes. Yeah. I've oh, had that's, people a, have that's a whore. Uh, for, pardon my term. Yeah. Yeah, a hired gun would be the hired nice gun who doesn't have any concern for truth. <laughs> yep, and a lot of these anti-PA people um, out and out lie. Mm. You know, test of even saying lies about me, so I know it's it's happening. Um, you know, I wish there was some way to hold them accountable. You know, there's a lot of money to be made by being an expert witness. I actually bowed out of it. I did it for a number of years and I just found it so um, ugly. You know, opposing counsel will just say whatever they can say to win. I actually had one treat me really nasty on the stand. And when I got off the stand, she actually came up to me and asked me for my autograph. I'm not kidding. I was like, no, like, mm -mm. If you want me to train you, I would be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not autographing something for you. I don't believe in autographs anyway. It's weird. But the point is, it's just she had no compunction about um, saying whatever she 
you know, could say with no, you know, allegiance to the truth. Yeah, it's really shocking. So um, in wrapping up, uh, other than letting people know you've written and co-written how many books? Is it seven or eight or? I think there's nine now. <laughs> nine. There's nine books. Good. So prolific. Uh, and they're good. And I have them on my shelf over there. Um, any last words you want to give to our listeners about this issue of parent? I, I know it is real from my own life experience and from working with clients. Um, but, uh, and that's why I went and did my doctoral dissertation was because I felt like the law needed to have a more concrete way to evaluate undue influence by looking at the influencer, the influencee, and the techniques, motives, consequences of the influence. Let a judge and jury decide. So that was my contribution to this to this field to try to demystify the fact that we're human beings and we are information organisms. <laughs> information matters. Who is in our environment matters. What programs we're listening to matters. But there's a, um, I think there's some like social psychology research that shows that most people think they're impervious to influence. Yep. You know, it's like, no, advertising doesn't work on me. That guy might be influenced to buy a Mercedes because of advertising. Oh, I bought mine because I like the German engineer, you know? Right. Um, yeah, so you can't tell people. I mean, it's very hard to tell somebody you're being influenced, right? Because we have this natural desire to want to experience ourselves as rational, you know, people making, you know, evidence-based decisions, but that's not, that's not true. Right. And we, we call that the myth of invulnerability. Yes, I'm exactly. smart, except when it happens to you, as it did with me, with the Moonies cult, I couldn't walk away. I it was like, you know, it really did happen to me. I dropped out of college, quit my job, donated my bank account, became a right-wing fascist, was willing to kill or die on command. And I'm a nice person who was not raised that way at all. So right. myself and a bunch of my friends and colleagues were trying to do a hashtag I got out effort on social media to make people reflect and go, you know what? I was in a controlling relationship or I was involved with a company where the boss was abusing us and using all of these techniques on us to to, to break down that myth of invulnerability that uh, it can never happen to you and to make it more of an exit ramp for people who are now starting to realize the election wasn't stolen. <laughs> there is no proof, you know, there is proof. Even four cases later. Yeah, and people are uh, dying of COVID by the hundreds of thousands and worldwide millions, and no one's dying in numbers from the vaccinations, you know, and to actually reconsider, hey, I was lied to, and I believed an authority figure I shouldn't have believed, and now what? Right, so making it sort of normalizing in a way. I know when I did my first book and then I sent it to the people I interviewed, each of them, well, I mean, many of them said to me, like, I didn't know there was a name for this. I thought I was the only person. Yeah. Right. So that's sort of the benefit of having it named and talking about it is that people know, like, you don't have to be ashamed if you believed your dad was a monster. And it turns out maybe that wasn't true. You know, right. you were a child. You, of course, you believe what your mom told you or again, vice versa. Um we want to take the shame away from it because that will help people, you know, be more likely. I, one of the people I interviewed had the whole epiphanal thought process, realized that her dad, you know, shouldn't have been cut out of her life. And I said, oh, so what's, what kind of relationship do you have with him now? And she said to me, oh, I haven't reached out to him. I'm, I'm too ashamed. And that was heartbreaking. We want to make it easy, easy to get out of it and easy to get into healthier relationships. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that actually, because, you know, I think always with my clients, what if you can identify the goals that are important to them 
and then you can think like what's missing that if they had it they could get to there or what's blocking them and if they can state in their own mind i would like to have a relationship with both my parents then if shame is the block then even introducing them to other people who were similarly alienated and now reconcile with their parents networking them with others so that they're not alone and that they realize actually there's more goodies by getting past the fear or the shame or the guilt and the main goodie is being true to yourself yes. you know living your own truth because sometimes when they reconnect with the formerly rejected parent the favorite parent cuts them off i mean there's a price to pay they have to uh, many of them, you know, realize that they didn't behave well, they hurt somebody and they have a lot of sadness over that or the missed opportunities. I can never go back to my sweet 16 party and have my parent there. So there's, it's not a free, you know, no cost experience to go through that process. But everybody I interviewed was, was, glad that they did they had no regret because they were they reconnected with themselves and their own truth yeah that's really important and i'm thinking also that for some young people reaching out to the grandparent first instead of the parent you know finding an old photo together and reaching mm -hmm. out finding some you know a, a lied person that and build bridges to the rest of the family is also another strategy that works I've also, I just want to ask you this and then we'll wrap up. I sometimes encourage with this no contact at all um, for the, uh, the parent to write poetry, write a song, make a website, you know, that says I miss you and write letters, even if you don't have a place to mail them at some point it will come across to the, the, the child that's not in currently in your life that you were thinking of them a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, depending on what you say, I absolutely agree. You never stop trying because then that'll be perceived and they didn't even bother to write, you know? Exactly. So, you, I mean, um, once the kids are over 18 and they're adults and certainly if they're in college, um, I do have a method of helping targeted parents write a letter to their, you know, adult alienated child. It's, uh, you know, highly, you know, tailored, you know, there's 10 paragraphs. Each one has a very specific function. It's like, um, it takes a whole hour to sort of teach the person about the letter and then give them homework and then an hour to write the letter together. Although it comes just from the parent. Right. Um, and that's, you know, been, I would say, fairly successful, certainly not every time. I'm sure there are times when the kids just delete, you know, they don't even read the email, you know, there's nothing you can do. But it's, it's been a helpful process, I think, for the, for the parent, because the philosophy of the letter is orienting them to their child's perspective. So it's not, let me tell you why you're wrong for being mad at me. I didn't steal your college money. You just think I did. That yeah. you know, it doesn't work. Um, so that's something I've given you know, a lot of thought so to. People is to can contact you for coaching is what the takeaway is on that. If, if a parent who's um, missing their children and wants to take steps to uh, reconnect. Yeah, because what seems so obvious, the thing that you want to do is to tell your side of the story to your child. It doesn't really work, but nor does apologizing for things you didn't do. So again, it sort of, it takes a little bit of figuring out how to, how to navigate that. Yeah, great. Dr. Amy Baker, amyjbaker.com is my recollection. Amy J. L. Baker. L. J. L. Baker. Thank you. Wow. Yep. Uh, to make it complicated. I have two middle right. initials. Well, you want to you, you want to make it special so people come to the right place. And if it says parental alienation, you know you found the right person with all the the book covers uh, that are listed and everything. I want to thank you again for your good work, all your contributions, and continued Likewise. success. Thank you. Back at you. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye.
Take care.